All right, welcome. We're gonna talk about optimizing Kubernetes operators and admission control with Pepper today. And we have a little skit that's a tale of breaking down organizational silos. So uh, who here has worked in, in big tech before? Yep, okay, I did too. And uh, one thing you notice about big tech is a lot of work is repeated, right? You have these organizational silos that happen very naturally. Um, and I guess, you know, in theory, that's, that's something that naturally occurs, but we can actually create um, basic standardizations. Uh, we can assign sane defaults. So the teams, we can basically offload work from teams. And that's essentially what Pepper is from high level. It's a mix between like an operator SDK or a kube builder and an OPA gatekeeper or a Kyverno. It has a validating and mutating webhooks in it. Um, it speaks natively to the kube API server via the watch mechanism. Um, it comes natively with a store that's backed by etcd, allowing you to essentially program in operational knowledge, like, hey, every two weeks, I need to restart this cluster, restart this database. Um, on every 30 minutes, I wanna run this like kind of cron job, right? It's got a schedule built in, it has a store built in. Um, and this API is very, very different. Very different from Kyverno and very different from OPA, which are great. We actually use uh, a lot of those tools internally as well. But the difference is Pepper is programmed, is configured through TypeScript, through a very simple, very fluent, if you will, API. So you don't necessarily have to be a Kubernetes expert to program your admission controllers and your Kubernetes operators. The API does a lot of the heavy lifting Outside of that, it comes with a Kubernetes client uh, that speaks server-side apply, which is a very efficient way to speak to the Kubernetes API server. Um, and it was built by Jeff McCoy. And we are from Defense Unicorns, and we solve problems of software delivery, actually very hard problems of software delivery. And uh, what Pepper is used for internally at Defense Unicorns is for deploying infrastructure and applications together. So effectively, think about assigning sane defaults throughout the cluster. Uh, that would be like pods, run as user, kind of creating standardization around the security context, creating validation rules around the security context. For instance, your pods are gonna get rejected if they're running as roots. If they're running with privileges, they're going to be rejected. Uh, if there is no security context assigned when it enters into the cluster, a sane default will be assigned. And then the other thing we, we do with Pepper internally is when an application is deployed into a cluster going through admission, we start watching that application or the, or the uh, custom resource. And then we automatically create uh, Istio's virtual services with it. We create network policy. And then we actually watch the Kubernetes API server and the services. And if anything changes, we make the changes in the network policies so in the end of the day, what's happening is our clients are simply deploying applications and those applications are being automatically configured. There is automatically uh, service monitors for Prometheus. You can create mutual TLS and that port will change automatically. So Pepper is effectively as an admission controller and as a participator to the Kubernetes Watch API is watching everything and making very complex configurations very simple. Hey, good morning, everyone. I'm Peggy. I am the chief architect here at Big Enterprise Company. And we have some really exciting news. We bought out a small company and we're merging all of their developers in um, because they have some really great products and they've got one app that we really, really want to integrate with ours. Um, which kind of leads me to Sparky. Sparky, we were told, was this great, amazing developer. Um, but you see, there's been a few difficulties with integrating him into our company. Um, so basically, I was told by my boss that I had to sit next to him this week to kind of help him adapt to our company. Um, to kind of give you an idea of what I'm talking about, let me show you how last week, his first week went. Are you a 
afraid of it? No. I I just don't like techno. You would if you had robot ears. So that's what I'm dealing with. Um, definitely not the standard approach we take here at Big Enterprise Company. So I'm Sparky. It is a pleasure to be here at Big Enterprise. But first, before we talk about Big Enterprise, let's talk about myself. I run as root. Um, you know, a lot of you all might be thinking like, that's not a best practice, but I assure you, I know the best practices and the reason that you all might know about them is because I discovered them and shared them all with you. Um, and honestly, if anyone can run as root, it would be me, right? I know what I'm doing. Uh, sometimes I configure the nodes. Uh, sometimes I write to the file system. Sometimes I fork bomb other clusters, other teams. <laughs> When they don't like my music, I, I play games. Um, but I'm the star around here. I pretty much run the show. Uh, and let's look at my app. My app is really a very beautiful architecture. It's very sophisticated. Uh, my backend, originally Java, but then I wrote it in Go. I wanted to kind of optimize, get a little quicker start before changing to Rust. A lot of, my, a lot of other people were using Rust, but then I realized, you know what? I'm just gonna go to Zig. You know, Zig makes the most sense. I'm brilliant programming, so I went to Zig, Russ, simple. My front end though, uh, first it was React, but then I had to switch to Preact. The footprint was a little bit big uh, before switching to Svelte. Uh, Svelte is just what everyone's using. But then I thought, why use a framework? Why don't I just write in, in vanilla, vanilla JS? Uh, and you know, it's, it's working for me. Uh, Valky, switched from Redis to Valky when it open source. And, you know, regular database, but it's very redundant. So uh, have you deployed it yet to our cluster? Uh, no, but don't worry about it. Uh, I'll deploy it later today, but I do know it's on my agenda. Yeah, so before you try to deploy, maybe we should take some time and kind of go over how we have our architecture here set up in the cluster. <laughs> Not now, Chief. I'm kind of in the zone. I gotta, I gotta get this done. Um, are, are you sure about that? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so, <sighs> Sparky, as you can see, I have my challenges laid out in front of me. Um, and modesty is absolutely not one of his strong points. Um, so he may not care too much about the architecture we've got here, but I'm the chief architect. I actually do care. Um, I've got over 200 apps that I'm running through multiple different zones, and I need to make sure that they're all secure and that they are sharing resources appropriately. Um, as part of that, we use both admission controllers um, and we have it set up as both mutating and validating webhooks. Um, I sent this information over to Sparky to kind of help him get up to speed. Um, but I'm gonna kind of give you a, the easy explanation here. Um, so, you know, imagine you're gonna go to a club and you get to the front door and there's two bouncers. Um, so the first bouncer is basically like a mutating webhook. That bouncer is checking to see if you're wearing a hat because no hats are allowed in the club. So if you have a hat, that bouncer is going to kindly take it from you and check it until you get ready to leave. So that's the mutating webhook. It checks to see if you're meeting the rules and can change what you're doing if you don't meet the rules. The next bouncer, um, that's our validating webhook. Web, web now that bouncer is going to look to see if you've got shorts on or not. Because if you've got shorts on, you're not coming in. Um, and yeah, that bouncer is not going to sit there and help you change pants there in you know, public, so it's just going to reject you if you're not wearing actual pants. So that's kind of the short explanation of our mutating and validating webhooks. Now, to make it easier for me to get all this stuff set up in our, in our cluster, um, we use what's called a pepper. And Pepper, outside of having this amazingly cute dragon, um, gives us a way to easily set up our mutating and validating webhooks. And we can also do some other really cool stuff like setting up some custom resources. Now, as far as being simple and easy to use, 
it can't get much easier than what you see on this next slide. Um, so you can see the format in the top part there. It really is that simple, that template. So, you know, basically the bottom is an actual segment of code of, you know, when a namespace is created um, and it has this annotation, we want you to mutate it. Now, what you do in the mutation, that's where the TypeScript comes in. If you can do it in TypeScript, you can code that logic here. And that's why we like this so much um, for what we were doing, just having YAML just didn't give us that capability that we needed. Now, to make it even easier, um, we have IntelliSense. Um, so we didn't wanna have to memorize all the options because again, we want it to be simple and easy. So with IntelliSense, when you type that A period, it's gonna show you all the resources that you can work with. Um, after you get that resource in there, it's gonna tell you the different events. You know, is created, is created or updated. Um, and then after that, it's gonna you know, tell you what you can do with that Kubernetes object. So again, we figured it was so easy to use that even our developers could do it. Um, we aren't quite sure about Sparky yet because as you saw, he does have an attitude. I'm not able to deploy my app. What really? in the world's going on? Yes, yes. I'm surprised. I'm truly yeah, shocked. Yeah, I am shocked too. That pepper thing, I, did I also hear it's going to get donated to the CNCF? Is that the goal of it? Yes. Oh, wow. Okay, well, first of all, first problem, and this is a major problem, Peg. I requested 100 cores of CPU to run my web app, right? I don't know the turn I'm going to face. I don't know if I'm going to crawl. I just, I need a lot of resources. And as we can see, or I'm sorry, and I also was like running as, as, a, as root, right? And this is going to, this is mutating my pods. My pods are being mutated here. Um, I don't want them mutated. Yeah, so remember that talk I wanted to have about the cluster? Yes, yes. Yeah, this was part Very of what busy. we wanted to talk about. Okay. So in our cluster, you can't run as root. Just, it's not gonna happen. Um, and I know you're used to it. Yes. I know that's the way you view the world, that you're special and deserve root, yes. but it's just not gonna happen here. Yes. Right, I came from VM, so I used to control my whole VM. My whole VM was my application. You know, as you can see in this code here, we got it set up so that if you try to run as root, it's going to mutate it and keep you from doing that. Yes. Um, and it does it consistently, so it's not just you. We aren't signaling you out. It's every team has the same thing. I see that, I see that. So you can effectively write code that checks if your security context is running as root, is running as zero. If it is, it will reassign that zero to a sane default. Exactly. Therefore, applying a standard for security context across the whole cluster? Yep. Oh, wow. Okay, that does seem secure. So, uh, next problem. Um, you know I'm a gamer, right? I think I, I told you that. Um, yes, many times. I have robot ears, which lets me hear the game, hear the internal voice of the game. I'm, I'm great at it. Um, and I like to actually install games on these nice EC2 clusters and instances, right? Because there's so much compute, there's so much power here, but I don't have the right volume type. And in fact, I'm getting rejected. It's not even mutating. It's just, it's straight up rejecting my pods. Yeah, well, I know that gaming really gets you in the zone. It does, yeah. But we just aren't gonna let you do it on our system. Okay. Um, so another thing that we have Pepper doing for us is it's taking a look at where you're trying to write your files and what permissions you've got. Mm. And once again, if you aren't following the rules, this is gonna fix it. So that I, as the administrator, don't need to worry about all these details with every single application. Yeah, 200 applications is a lot to keep track of. And that's kind of shifting a lot of these security responsibilities away from the developers so they can practice more on their code. But it's so simple, Peggy, right? When a pod is created or updated, then you mutate it, then you validate it. That's the admission control sequence, wow. Okay, I still have another problem, Peg. Um, look, now I'm trying to write to through the file system, right? I'm basically uh, binding to a host path on the node. Uh, again, I, I wanna install cool binary. I'm working on it on Zig. Um, it's going to be revolutionary, but I'm gonna need the cluster. I'm gonna need to write to the node. Uh, yeah, so that's not secure. So okay. that's another thing we have Pepper taking a look at gotcha. for us. If you're gonna to try to write to the host uh, file system, it's not going to let you. 
And I know that interferes with your gaming, mm, but yeah. it's just the way we have to do things here. Oh, okay, okay. And then uh, this is what I was noticing earlier too, right? Like, you know, sometimes my app will like crawl the web, crawl other websites, crawl other internal applications. It's hilarious. And I click buttons and just, I cause chaos. But you know, the, the limits that I request for that is literally 20 cores of CPU, uh, maybe about 50 gigs of memory. I don't know what I'm gonna encounter, you know, but it's, it's getting changed, it's mutating. Yeah, well, remember those 200 other apps out there? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they need resources also. Oh, really, even though uh, they're not that special? Uh, I, I know nothing's nearly as special mm -hmm. as your app, okay. but Yes, Okay. They, they also need resources. So we've got Pepper set up that's giving same default limits, setting how much you can use as far as memory and um, processing power okay. so that all the other apps can run also. Okay, okay. So I finally got it deployed, but that was a lot to chew. Let, let me kind of like regurgitate what I believe you just said. So Pepper has a mutating and a validating webhook, right? Mm -hmm. So the mutating webhook can change, can literally change resources that come into uh, the admission control. Correct. And after all of those changes, and there can be many mutating webhooks, is that correct? That's correct, as many as we need to keep developers like you in check. Okay, and then after all the mutations are complete, there are these validating webhooks that check the final state and decide whether to accept or reject the request. Correct. And how many validating webhooks are there? As many as we need. <sighs> okay, I get it. Well, I'm finally deployed. It looks like I can kick back and let this company, Big Enterprises, uh, know what a genius I am. Oh my gosh, it's Friday afternoon and I have an email. Let's see what this is. Uh-oh. Um, okay, yeah, I'm reading this email right now. So there's apparently a security concern. Uh, it's actually from a very downstream product, but I'm gonna need to patch my product. The strange thing is I'm gonna have to redeploy everything. All those deployments, the services, the config maps, the service account, the secrets, the roles, the role bindings, all of that, that was hard. I come from the VM world. That's difficult. Yeah, well, remember those emails I sent you with all that information about custom resource definitions and controllers? Did you take a look at that? Yeah, I, actually I did, yeah. Okay, and what did you learn? I learned that a custom resource is a new resource or a custom resource that you make in Kubernetes. A custom resource will have a spec. A spec can have fields like replicas, I don't know, theme, language, and what this spec represents is an actual application. And then, if I'm not mistaken, I'm new to this, behind that custom resource, there will be a controller. The controller will frequently watch admission through the, for instances of that custom resource, or maybe it's connected through the Kubernetes watch API, but nonetheless, watching for changes of this instance of this custom resource definition. Say, in my case, something like a web app. My web app, Sparky's web app, has multiple languages. It has English and it has Spanish. It has a light theme and a dark theme, and it has a number of replicas. So from what I understand is this can actually represent the Kubernetes manifests that are required to deploy my application. So when I deploy a web app instance, it will deploy in turn the deployment, the service, the config maps, the rules, the role bindings, and watch the state of the cluster so that the desired state is equal to the actual state. Yeah, and if you take a look at this code here, you can see just how easy it is to set that up. Mm, wow. um, so I know that they're putting a lot of pressure on you to get it done yeah. right now, mm -hmm. but take a look at the example, and I bet you you can probably get something put together and get that fixed out today. Wow. So let me ask you something. I see this, I see validate, right? And then I see reconcile. So let me make sure I'm understanding what's happening. When I am deploying an instance of the web app, the validating web hook is going to actually validate that that instance is acceptable to go into the cluster, correct? Yes. Okay, and then after this reconcile loop, I think I read in the materials that you told me that Pepper speaks natively to the Kubernetes API, the Kube API server. It does. Old 6443. Yes. Okay, well question. The reconcile is different than the watch because the reconcile will take the work and take the events coming back from the Kube API server and stick them into a queue 
for ordered processing. Yes, it will. So if I'm not mistaken, if there is one instance of my web app that resolves, that's completely deployed in, I don't know, five seconds, and another one that has heavier processing, and it takes maybe three minutes to complete, they're still going to resolve in order. Yes, they are. That makes it perfect for an operator builder. Yes. Wow. Okay, and I also noticed there's a store here, right? The set mm -hmm. item. So if I'm not mistaken, every time we see an instance of a web app, we store it in the store with its name. And then, likewise, the web app, the operator will deploy the deployment, the custom resource definition, all of the above. But if someone was to come behind some bad, bad actor and try to delete the deployment that belongs to this specific resource, it's just going to look into the store and see that item is still in the store and simply redeploy it. That's right. So there's no way to destroy my application by deleting the actual resources. Correct, and unless you go in and do something yourself, uh -huh. um, which hopefully you won't do, yes. yes. Interesting, okay. Wow, I love this store mechanism. And now I can actually see the filters. You can say when they're deleted, when they're updated, and we're actually searching for things by a specific name and a specific label. Hmm. The other thing I wanted to understand is how does the web app own the deployment, the service, the service account? So what if you take a look at the next slide here? Okay. Ah, I see. Okay, so there's an owner reference. So the owner reference, so basically in the deploy function, if I'm, if I'm uh, not mistaken, the reconciler will actually read the instance of the custom resource definition. As soon as it's being read, it updates the status. It will slap an event on that object based on the UUID, and then it will update the status field that says currently processing. After that, it's going to deploy the necessary resources for the web app behind the scenes, the deployment, the service, and that's based on the spec. And then after it's all done, it'll update the status again and say, you're done. And when it deploys the, uh, the deployment, the service, et cetera, they're going to have the owner reference of the web app instance. So if I delete the web app, everything is going to have a cascading delete? Correct. Interesting. Okay, wow. Now I can really see the power of Pepper. So before, before we go on though, I wanted to ask something about the, the Kubernetes Fluent API. Okay. So when something comes through admission, I could theoretically do something like multi-cluster. I could actually call out to another cluster and replicate it for redundancy. Yes, you could. Interesting. And the KFC, it's a client, right? And I can mm -hmm. then automatically on the fly create resources in my other cluster? Yes, you can. Okay, wow. Okay, folks. Uh, that's it for the slides. Um, and now we have a, a very uh, little spiel about, about Pepper. We wanna be uh, donated to the CNCF. That's our aspirations one day. Um, and, and we love, like I said, we love the, the other admission controllers. And I came from, from Red Hat before I was here. And we, I was super into operator SDK. But we think this is a much faster way to take you to a POC to validate an assumption and then a lot of teams will build operators and they'll hand them off to a new team or hand them off to an SRE team or something like that, right? It's a way easier, it's a different way, it's a flexible way, right? But you have all the power of TypeScript, right? TypeScript is type safe, very, very flexible, even more flexible than Go, although I love Go. Uh, but you can do a lot of things. Um, so we, we would love for you all to, uh, to give it a try. Um, and we also want you all to consider donating or, or contributing to Pepper. Uh, and you can contribute by opening up issues, uh, feature requests on our, on our GitHub, submitting PRs, uh, and writing documentation. We also have a Kubernetes Slack channel, so if you want to contribute but you don't know what to do, or you just have questions about Pepper, like, hey, I have this crazy use case. I want to audit every single thing that comes in my cluster. How would I do that? Or, you know, I want to go multi-cluster. I want to build an operator. We have a whole repository of excellent examples, um, and we use it internally like crazy. Um, so I'm Case. Uh, I'm the lead software engineer on Pepper. You can hit me up on LinkedIn or GitHub, and Defense Unicorns slash Pepper GitHub, of course, is where we... Uh, where we're hosted. And Kim? Yep, and I am Kim Schaefer. I am a software engineer at Defense Unicorns. Um, you can see my contact information here, and we'd really love to see what you build with Pepper and uh, welcome you to contribute. 
Yeah, and so now I wanted to ask, uh, I want to ask you all some question, one question first, uh, and then I'll have, let you all ask me questions. Um, and uh, you guys can't answer. So in admission control, there's two phases, right? There's a, there's a validating and a mutating phase, correct? Which phase comes first, or does it matter which one comes first? Are they interchangeable? Correct. Yes, yes. You can get a sticker. <laughs> After, okay. All right. Um, another one. Um, Pepper comes with a, with a Kubernetes client, right? And it's, it has server-side apply built in. Who knows what server-side apply is and how it's different than regular kubectl apply? I'm going to let Eddie, I'm going to let Eddie take this one. Eddie, what's server-side apply? Eddie works on a kubectl. Kube control. Really hard to explain, but yeah. the idea is that instead of the client being smart and doing resolving on client side, uh, we offload all of that logic to the server side, which is where when people do things like roll out, undo, and stuff, it breaks all sorts of things. So use, use apply, use server side apply, thank you. Yes, yes. Server side apply is much more efficient on a network. It only, it applies the deltas, right? It doesn't apply everything like the client. The client doesn't know, the server knows everything. So it offloads a lot of that logic to, uh, to the server, which makes it extremely like efficient. Um, and, and last question I have, uh, it's about Kubernetes watch, right? There's, there is this mechanism when you talk to Kube, Kubectl, right? Kubernetes API server, you can get resources, you can patch resources, you can update resources, you can delete them. Um, what is watch? Has anyone ever heard of watch? Is it, is it the same as admission? Who wants to go on that? Give it a shot. Yes. That's exactly right. Yes, it will return changes of state. And this is, a, this is a really deeper question. Why would you sometimes consider using watch rather than the regular admission controller? Because the regular admission controller, you don't need any RBAC to mutate a pod or to validate a pod. Why would you sometimes use watch, which actually does require RBAC? So this is because, does anyone know this? You'd be in the context of like the request to the admission controller. Yes. So it's, that's, that's correct. So the, the real difference is the admission controllers are bound by a webhook timeout. Now that timeout is configurable, but it's set by default to 10 seconds across all clusters. You shouldn't technically extend that timeout, right? Because there's the timeout, webhook timeout, and this is on the mutating webhook configuration, validating webhook configuration. There's the timeout, and there's also a failure policy. What the failure policy will do is, if this request times out, do I reject this resource from going to my cluster, or do I admit it? Now, if you're a validating webhook for security purposes, you should reject it. But the more process thing you're doing when you see a thing come in, whatever this Kubernetes object is, you're calling out, you're doing 50 things, doing five API calls or 10 or something, you should probably use watch, which is not bound by any type of timeout. Um, and so that would be one reason potentially to use watch. And then in Pepper, right, so these, these events are coming back, right? These, but let's say it's more like a custom resource definition that's cranking out a bunch of compute. Every single time it sees it, it's gotta like update the state of like five clusters. Well, in that case, you sh we, sh we actually prefer to use reconcile in Pepper because that's gonna put the work in the queue. So then everything goes into the queue and it's processed in the order in which it goes in and then it's uh, taken out of the queue. Um, so that's enough for me. What questions do you all have? Yeah, go ahead. Your, your plug is duct typing yet? Uh-uh, no. What is that? We'll, we'll talk later. Okay, cool. <laughs> nice. Um, is, is this something that, that anyone can see, like your organization or, or your own, you know, home lab setup using? Like, do you all see any, like, kind of use cases for this? Yes, right, right. And you know, that's, that's kind of the beauty of the webhooks. Like, use webhooks when you can, because it 
requires no RBAC. It's like great. And also it's like the difference, uh, the difference between the Kube API server and your Pepper controller is like one namespace apart, right? It's in cluster communication. It's extremely fast. Um, and, and like that's a, a question I've gotten so many times is why TypeScript? Um, why not go? You know, everything's go. Um, and it was really because of that API you also earlier. It's like in TypeScript, you can do it like kind of very like with like these like kind of callback functions and it kind of makes sense. It's kind of like English a little bit. Like when a web app is created or update, then I want to validate that the web app makes sense. Like the spec, like did they butcher the spec and say I want 10,000 replicas? In that validating controller, I'm going to say like max replicas is like, you know, five. Uh, then you're going to like do that watch, right? You're going to send the, all these events like, hey, I'm watching this web app to the Kube API server. And every time API server comes back with something, stuff it in the, in the queue and then go ahead and reconcile it. Yep. So to do web hooks, you need to do XLS. So you yes. need to generate a cert somewhere. Yes. Are you doing that yourself, or are you yes. through the common uh, cert managers? Yeah, oh my gosh, I can't believe I forgot to address that. So the, 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 like the beauty of Pepper, the thing that makes all this is so you write this, right? Let's say you write like this definition here, or whatever. All you do is you say npx pepper build, right? We will get the, the cube CA and we'll create the certs. We'll, we'll do everything for you. We'll stuff them in a secret, mount it to the pod, make the communication between Kube API server and the webhook work flawlessly. We handle all of the configuration for you. So every time you, you create, you know, we're watching web apps here, but let's say you say when a pod, or you say, you know, when something else is created or, or deleted or something, that and you build again, that is going to update your mutating or validating webhook configuration, depending whether it's mutating or validating. So you don't have to worry about those intense configurations, making the webhooks, all that stuff is, uh, all the configuration part is one of the most annoying things, especially when you just want to validate an idea. Like, can I theoretically do this? And after I do, I'm passing off my SREs because they're responsible to the cluster or my platform people. Yeah, so basically, yes, we actually made it Easy enough that Sparky can do it. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, go ahead. What is the most interesting use case you've seen for Pepper? Oh, that's, that's a great question. I would have to say I'm, um, I'm biased, but the use case, my internal use case my company has, um, and that's like the, the you know, to, to put it very simply, it's like, it's deployments in very difficult environments. Sometimes those environments don't have internet, so like they're air gapped. But we want to make it so the person who deploys their application, right? It's like everyone's not as good in, in Kubernetes as you all, right? But the idea is that anyone can deploy their web app, and that web app will be automatically configured with network policy. It'll automatically be scraped with service monitors for Prometheus. The uh, Prometheus rules will automatically be added. And then all of a sudden, you're responsible for your own app instead of all this crazy configuration. By the way, like depending on if you have like, uh, you know, strict mutual TLS for like a peer authentication policy in Istio, that will change the way your service monitor, like which port it's scraping on. All that stuff matters. So we built an operator with it that does uh, enforce these defaults. But the really, the, the interesting use case is like, it configures everything when you deploy an application. So you don't have to worry about all of that stuff. And it's honestly more and more every time. Um, that's, that's probably it. Yeah. Um, I, I spoke with you a few days ago, and you, you said you're, you're a student. Um, could you see yourself using something like Pepper? And if you like spin up a, a, a cluster? Uh, I've never played with Kubernetes, so okay. I can't say. Gotcha. So. Yes. That's a really good and fair question. Um, you know, if you're, uh, if you're, if if Kyverno or, or Opa does exactly what you need, and you're you're not worried about like the overhead, like if it's not too heavy, right? Then, then you know why why change what works? You know, I don't I don't think you know you just change for the sake of it. I think you can play with it and see if there's more things. Um, also, it's like 
for shops that are extremely into Kube Builder or Operator SDK, they've done it for like 10 years, and they're like, or like five years, it hasn't been out that long. But they're like, why should I change? Um, it's like, well, I mean, if you're, if you, your whole team is an expert in it, like, you probably shouldn't change. Like, you know, you're gonna switch to TypeScript, you're probably better at Go it anyway, uh, if you're super familiar with it. Um, but conversely, why, why you could use it, one, it's like if you're using OPA and you're using Operator SDK, you have all those resources running, those are like two different controllers, it could just be one controller. And the funny thing is, Pepper's controller runs in an image, but all this stuff you write here is minified and stuffed into a secret and mounted onto the controller. So this is extremely lightweight. What's that? It's a pretty strict size limit. Are you yeah. about outgrowing that? Um, we have an issue that we're watching for outgrowing it. If we ever do hit it, we'll, what the, the, the high level, what I think we do, is we'd stick more secrets on there and then we'd assemble them at, at boot time. But, but surprisingly, we have like tree shaking built in when you do like MPX pepper monitor and MPX pepper build and tree shaking basically looks at your dependency tree and if, if you're not actually using something you've imported, it'll like tell you to remove it. Uh, it's been good size. The only time we've seen someone hit that limit is when they imported AWS, uh, AWS library, and it was like huge. And they were like barely using anything. So it was like they didn't know TypeScript and they didn't know how to like import only what they needed. But yeah, they hit that limit. Kubernetes Slack, like let's chat, let's talk, let's be friends, uh, let's contribute. We're also really nice. Uh, we also like, we accept pull requests. We work with you. We'll make sure you understand it and how to do it. And we like coach you if you all want to contribute to Pepper. And we'd love to hear how it works for you all. <laughs>